All right, Cherubs, this is the Flatiron Building in New York City. It's such an iconic building that the entire district surrounding it has taken its name. It wasn't, though, as some would assert, New York City's first skyscrapers. It could very well be, though, New York's first great building. In 1892, just 10 years before the Flatiron Building opened its doors, a reporter in the city wrote, We have no palaces, no public buildings, no great structures of any kind to which we can point with pride. Of course, that reporter must have forgotten about the Brooklyn Bridge, but the point is well taken. How could New York be one of the world's great cities without structures it could be proud of? So let's tell the story of this building, and in doing so, tell the story of how tradition can collide with the specific requirements, cultural influences, and technological innovations of a particular time and place to produce something timeless. The plot of land at this location, where 5th Avenue meets 23rd and Broadway, was called the Flatiron Building before the idea of this building even existed. It's shaped like a flat iron. Around 1900, however, land like this, whatever its shape, was becoming too valuable to sit empty. New York architects and financiers leveraged recent innovations in steel frame construction to build high, but those with aesthetic concerns wondered if these new skyscrapers could ever be beautiful. The tallest structures in traditionally beautiful European cities were cathedrals, and these skyscrapers were impressive, sure, but a tall office building has an imposing monotony that a tall cathedral avoids. To build something on this triangular patch of land seemed utilitarian, and it wouldn't give New York City that great building it needed to compete with European cities. New York seemed to surrender beauty to increase opportunity and accommodate the flood of immigrant workers. The dumbbell tenement buildings of this time, crowded and lacking windows, are perhaps the best expression of this sacrifice. New York's business demanded utility, but New York's artists starved for beauty. Luckily, the architects of the Flatiron Project had helped build the White City for Chicago's World's Columbian Exposition, an exposition celebrating the 400th anniversary of Columbus encountering the Americas and designed to demonstrate ideal neoclassical architecture. It demonstrated how American architects could interpret tradition in one of their own cities. In fact, one of these architects, Frederick P. Dinkelberg, once articulated his thoughts on how to build a new American style of architecture. He said, It is very doubtful, to my mind, whether we can create a new style by an abrupt breaking off or ignoring the traditional architectural forms. He thought that New York should interpret tradition in creative ways, but still keep the tradition. The Flatiron is designed with Romanesque tiles, geometric designs, and Corinthian columns on a terracotta tiling. Atop the building sit two cherubs who sit watch over Manhattan. Unlike those tenement buildings, the Flatiron building would have more than 700 windows, and because of its height, they would flood the building with unobstructed light throughout the day. The choice of terracotta for the exterior is interesting for a number of reasons. The Great Fire of Chicago, for one, taught architects the importance of fireproofing and terracotta, burnt earth, cannot be burnt again. The ancients used it for tiles and drain pipes, but the flat iron reimagines the material for a sculpted facade. It looks, as one author noted, like a classical column that has been pounded down and reshaped into a skinny triangle and plumped down in America. It's such a wonderful building that it becomes easy to talk about the features that make it new or different, but for me at least, the parts of the building that synthesize the past through the lens of New York are the most interesting. A few years after its construction, a Times reporter overheard a couple arguing about the building. One claimed that there is something spirited and commanding in it. It gives an accent to the vistas of two great thoroughfares. The other responded dismissively, but the accent is so very American. And that's the point, I guess. The building isn't an imitation of classical architecture. It decorated the commercial utility of turning a skinny triangle into over 20 stories of rentable space with the slim eloquence of a Corinthian column. It covered the innovation of steel frame architecture with the ancient building material of carved terracotta. The building speaks the language of the past in the proud accent of its time and place. And shouldn't that be what we're looking for in all great art? An understanding of the past applied to the present circumstance? If you like this video and want to be updated when new videos are posted, please hit the subscribe button. You can also help me make videos by checking out my Patreon page in the link below. Thanks for watching.